I'm Aubrey Sitterson, and this is Scald. You're listening to the only story that matters. A weekly, serialized tale that is a brutal, weird, nihilistic, psychedelic take on sword and sorcery fiction. I write every episode myself. And then I record them, and get this, one single, flawless take. Each episode of Scald picks up where the last one left off, but I advise against starting from the beginning. Instead, just jump right in with this, the best episode yet. Then, later... If you want to find out what you missed, you can listen to previous episodes of the podcast or pick up the prose volumes available exclusively on Amazon. Or you could always just stick with the new stuff since there will be a brand new episode waiting for you next week. This isn't me reading you a story. This is me telling you a story. This is Scald, Part 93. The call had been too much to resist. The summons had cut into him deeply, had seized something at the core of his being, something that he didn't even know existed. It wrapped its beckoning fingers around it, and it pulled. It compelled him forward. It urged him to do its bidding. And so, Master Ho, he of the exquisite eight-armed technique, he obeyed as they fought and bickered. His erstwhile student and that savage destroyer. As they puffed up their chests and jockeyed for position. As they spoke of their bloody bargain and their other grisly pursuits. Ho laid the spear upon the ground. Relieved, he abandoned that long, blackened, dread weapon. The one with the glowing red veins that seared his eyes, that lurked at the edges of his vision even as he turned away from the weapon and began to make his way down the stairs. He moved quickly, but it was impossible for him to move quickly enough, to move as fast as he knew that he needed to. And so, The voice urged him on. It goaded him. It drove him faster and faster as he charged down the stairs, less falling than running, skipping one, skipping two, skipping three stairs, and then, eventually, simply leaping from landing to landing before gathering himself and jumping once again. The building shook around him. The entire city shook around him. That entire, blasted, damned, forsaken border realm shook and spasmed around him. But throughout it all, the voice did not cease. The voice that came from without, but echoed within. The voice that burrowed down, not into his brain, but into his very soul. The voice that filled him with a Passion he thought long lost to him, the voice that invigorated him, driving him down, down, down to the streets below. And once there, what he saw, it horrified him. 
It disgusted him. It shamed him for the ways in which he had been complicit in what had occurred, what he had allowed to occur, what he had been too lazy, too self-interested, too cowardly to stand up against. And as he looked, as he shuddered at the sight that lay before him, the voice, the one that had been prodding him, had been goading him, been encouraging him, it suddenly took on a new tone. That of admonishment. Because as he looked out at the carnage and terror that had gripped the city, gripped his city, gripped his home, gripped Ravenna, as he saw citizens rioting, as he saw proctors pummeling them, as he saw soldiers deserting, as he saw proctors blocking their way, as he saw men, women, and children fleeing in fear, as he saw the helpless driven before those who, even in the waning of their power, of their strength, would seek to bring violence to bear upon those they could. The voice, it shamed him and filled with shame, filled with disgust for those who he looked upon and for himself for having allowed it, for having allowed things to get this way, for thinking that Ravenna's problems would sort themselves out, for thinking that he did not need to get involved. He agreed with the voice. He concurred. He assented. And he made a decision to take Action. There was no time for words. And besides, he had no stomach for speeches. Not now. Not with that voice ringing in his head. The voice that previously won of admonishment. And now, as he decided to act, as he decided to once again obey it, to do as it urged him, as it commanded, as it demanded, the voice had become one of encouragement. The voice sang in his head as he lunged forward, ready to speak to those thugs, to those violent monsters, to address them in the only language they could possibly understand. Violence. He targeted the worst of them. The proctors. Those simpering cowards. The ones who had failed time and time again to create their own power. To discover their own strength. To make themselves worthy of the respect they so craved. They had, no doubt, suffered the same cruelties and indignities as anyone. As Ho himself had in his childhood. From that bullying, from that torment, they had learned the wrong lessons. They had, in their lust for power that they could not summon up and thus did not deserve, they had resolved to find it in the one place they could. In black cloaks and batons, slick with gore. No. There was no sense in speaking to them. Because even if he did, even if he could, even if Ho had wanted to, what would he say? What could he possibly say? What could he tell them that they hadn't heard a million times before? And what could he offer them that could compare with the taste of meager power that they had been allowed? The taste of strength that Calaria, the lady of Ravenna, the deceased lady of Ravenna, had allowed them? No. They were once men. But Calaria had turned them into something else, turned them into wild dogs, into rabid wolves, into an unthinking pack that now, without a master, without an alpha to guide them, without anyone to rein them in, had only one fate that awaited them. Death. So with that voice singing in his head, 
with it guiding his every motion, Ho went to work. He flung himself into the mass of convulsing, fighting, rioting flesh, and he lashed out. Not at everyone. No. Let the looters loot. Let them take what their labors had provided, what their sacrifices had created, what their tears and blood had coaxed forth from the earth. Let the deserters desert. Let them run away from the horrors they had been compelled to face, the terrors that they had been forced to face, the certain death that their masters decreed that they suffer. No. Ho lashed out only at those cruel, black-cloaked, cowardly proctors. And he lashed out at them with every weapon available to him. Animated by that riotous, eight-armed star, the one that spun and was driven by the voice within him, he lashed out with fist, with foot, with knee, and with elbow, with head, and with hip. He struck the unprepared, unskilled thugs, those cruel, cowardly proctors, those who were only strong in a group, who only knew the power, the false power, that came with conformity. He struck them again and again, but he only struck each once because he did not make use of the distracting blow. No, these proctors, these cowards, these bullies, these mockeries of men, they were already distracted enough, distracted by the rumbling of the ground at their feet, the crumbling of the city above their heads, distracted by the running, panicking crowds and by the chance at power, the opportunity for strength that fled with them. They were distracted by their lust, not for flesh, but for notoriety, for respect, for the foul pride that comes with forcing another man down to the ground. And so they left themselves open for the mercy blow. Oh, struck them again and again dropping them where they stood, fingers to the eyes, driving deep until they would go no further, elbows to the throat, driven so hard that their windpipes crushed under the pressure, leaping knees to the jaw so sudden, so quick that he heard their necks crack in response, quivering punches to the chest that disrupted the proctor's cravenly beating hearts. Ho was a maelstrom of violence, a whirlwind of righteous destruction, and for the first time in as long as he could remember, he was happy. Like any mortal, he was happy to see his skills put to use Happy to see the effects of his training, of his studying, of his sacrifice. Thrilled to see them used effectively, efficiently, put forth to accomplish a goal. But more than that, he was happy because of what that goal was. He no longer found pleasure in the simple practice of his eight-arm technique, but rather found true joy in fighting, not for himself, but for others, for the beaten and the bruised citizens, for the terrified deserters, the ones that cowered beneath him, sure that they were next. He no longer needed to create a god to empower him. He no longer needed to imagine a spirit, to invent a spirit to invoke, because he found ecstasy, he found enraptured bliss in the service of those who needed him. He turned to those frightened people, his bright green eyes flashing in a calming, soothing rhythm. And he spoke to them, in a voice that was not the one he had believed to be his own. Go, quickly, leave this place. 
host spoke in a voice of clear, ringing honesty. He spoke with the voice that cried out victoriously within him. This is now no place for a man to make his home. If it ever was. He paused for a moment. An ever so brief moment. Standing amidst the fallen bodies, standing amongst that mound of black cloaks, of batons dropped from now lifeless hands, he surveyed his work for an instant, until he saw a flutter of motion in his periphery. He turned, and he saw the child, a young urchin, likely an orphan, stooping down to pick up the baton to replace his filthy rags with the thick black cloaks of the proctors. No. O spoke once again in a voice that was not his own, but one that he found himself growing accustomed to. And the child, the urchin, he stopped and he looked up, mesmerized by Ho's eyes, incongruously bright and green in that ancient, lined, oval face. No, you don't need it. You're better. And without a word of disagreement, the child smiled nodded, stood, turned, and ran, leaving the baton, leaving the cloak, leaving them both in the dirt where they belonged. Then it was Ho's turn to run. He charged ahead, reinvigorated, filled with a life and a vitality that he had not known since before he lost his school, since before he tasted wine since back when he was a careless, carefree child. He charged ahead, and he lashed out wherever he saw those black cloaks. He lashed out wherever he saw a baton raised in violence, saw one swung with ill intent. He lashed out at every proctor he saw, and he dropped them where they stood. He gave them no chance to defend themselves because that time was past. He gave them no chance to explain themselves because he knew what they would say. He knew their explanation. They had wanted power. They had wanted to feel strong and they didn't care about the cost. No, they were bullies, they were thugs, they were monsters, more terrifying than even the destroyer that Ho had left in the tower. For even a destroyer fights for a cause, fights for something else, a destroyer destroys for a reason. These men, these poor excuses for men and women. They, they fought only for themselves. They fought only to elevate themselves by debasing others, never realizing the simple, sad, ironic truth that they debased themselves, that they debased all humanity in the process. So he ran. And he fought. He let the voice drive him forward. He subjugated his will to the voice until, eventually, he came to a joyous realization. The voice and his will, they were one and the same. So no longer did the voice lure him or drive him or force him forward. No, the voice ran with him. The voice, the one he had failed to recognize, the one that he could not even understand. Its identity was revealed. It was his own. So he ran through 
those filthy, riotous, crumbling streets. He charged ahead. He ran to where the voice called him. He ran to where he knew he needed to go. He ran forward. He plowed ahead. He charged through the very center of Ravenna, the center of that dying city. And before him, as he ran, as he charged, as he fought and he lashed out, as he liberated Ravenna's broken populace, as he helped them cast off the yoke of the proctors as he slayed those vicious cruel thugs he looked out looked up at what loomed above him the wall of tears or at least what was left of it He looked upon what remained of that impregnable wall, the wall laced with magics that were older than the city itself, that were older than anything that still drew breath upon that border realm, magics that thrived in the days before the worlds were sundered. He looked upon that shattered wall, and he saw divinity. He felt the shining, forgotten woman who had made her home there, and he felt a sense of overwhelming, crushing, crippling loss. But not for the woman. No, he felt that sense of loss, that sense of longing, that sense of something taken and withheld, of something that was improbably once again within his grasp. He felt for centaurs. The horde had broken through, or something had broken through. Something had shattered the primeval magics that held that ancient wall together, that caused those simple stones to come together, to create something more, something better. Something had dried the very tears that acted as the mortar for that ancient, awe-inspiring wall, and as a result, it had crumbled through that massive gaping hole, the one that opened up to reveal the wilderness beyond, to reveal the sprawling grasslands and plains that had once been the city, had once been Ravenna, had once been touched and defiled by the creeping corruption of civilization. And out of that hole, belched forth by that gaping maw with its cracked and crumbling stone teeth, streamed the centaur horde. Ho had never seen them. He had read. He had heard tales. He had seen pictures. He had even gazed upon them from a distance. From the tower at the very center of Ravenna, he had looked upon them as he first heard the voice, the voice that had drawn him there. But he had never truly seen them. He had never really looked upon them before that moment. And he found himself shocked. He was in awe. Yes, he was terrified, of course, but also something else. There was something familiar in those rippling, heavily muscled forms. There was something comforting in that lathered horse flesh. There was something pure and untouched in the way they moved, not as an army of individuals subsumed under a single command, but as a single organic entity, united in cause and in purpose, united in a singular belief in what was true, in what was worth fighting for, in what was worth defending, worth reclaiming and protecting. Yes, there was something familiar in the centaurs, something he could not articulate, something he didn't want to articulate. Because to name it, to put words to it, to make it conceivable by his human mind, it would be an act of blasphemy. 
to name it, to limit it to human understanding, to limit it to his deficient speech would be profane. He would defile the very purity that spoke to him, the very purity that had called him there, the very purity exhibited by the centaurs. And their flashing green eyes. But before he could spare another thought, before he could decide what to do, before he could seek to commune with the voice, the voice that having brought him there, having spirited him away from that crumbling, cracking tower of blood and the riotous city that surrounded it, from what remained of Ravenna, before he could do anything, he saw that it was not solely centaurs that poured forth from the now broken wall of tears. First, all he could see were glints of steel, flashes of sunlight reflected back at him. But as it moved forward, as the centaurs fought and scrambled to get out of its way, to escape its murderous limbs, Ho gasped as he caught sight of that monstrosity, that abominable creation, that thumb in the eye of the natural world. The cataclysmaton. His ears, previously filled with the emboldening sounds of the centaur stampede, of hoof upon ground, of shattering stone, they were now accosted by something else. They were subjected to horrible sounds that filled his heart with fear and his eyes with tears. He cringed as he heard a symphony of suffering, the howls and the cries of dying centaurs, of centaurs unable to defend themselves, unable to protect the horde, and throughout it all, a grim, grisly punctuation, the rising crescendo of that machine's horrific clanging, the sounds of its drills spinning, of its blades swinging, of its exquisite gears grinding together. Ho oh, looked out at that terror, at that tangible sin of progress, and he stared in awe as it did what miles upon miles of walls could not, as it did what an army of proctors could not, as it did what legions of brave men and women could not, as it did what his own students could not, as it did what the entire city of Ravenna could not, as it did what the forgotten woman could not, as it, the cataclysmaton, that transgression against all of creation, broke and slaughtered the centaur whore. He stood for a moment, eager to commune with the voice, to hear what it had to say, to hear why it had brought him there, to hear what it would have him do, what anyone could do in the face of such an atrocity. And upon doing so, he soon learned that his communion was unnecessary. Because he and the voice, the voice and his will were, once again, one and the same. And so, he did as the voice beckoned. He did as his will demanded. And he marched forward to face the cataclysmaton. Thanks for listening to the very best episode of Scald yet. I am happy to announce that all of my begging and pleading and threatening paid off, as there are now some brand new Scald reviews on iTunes. But that doesn't mean that the rest of you can rest on your laurels. If you haven't yet, open up iTunes on your computer, smartphone, or tablet. Search for Scald. Click Ratings and Reviews, and then choose to write your own review for the only story that matters. It doesn't even have to be long. Just say something and give the show five stars so we can continue growing. 
Best of all, if you leave a good review, I'll read it right here on the show. Armored Ace says, A story woven by a silver tongue. I was first introduced to Aubrey's work through his guest appearances on fantasy fiction and tales from the tavern. After much laughing, I realized I enjoyed how serious his stories became, even if it was just a momentary pause from the humor. Listening to Scald was the next logical step, and one that I don't regret in the slightest. Aubrey does a magnificent job telling a tale that is full of new and wonderful characters, and he brings them all crashing down into a grim reality that is cold, apathetic, and filled with chaos in all its forms. From tense dialogue scenes, vivid and explosive action sequences, and a plot that seems bottomless in its complexity and intricacies, Scald is enrapturing from its very first episode. Reviews are crucial to Scald's growth, but the only reason I'm able to continue doing the show is Patreon. That's right. This episode, as well as every other episode of Scald, is brought to you by my Patreon donors. Folks who have signed up through Patreon's simple, secure, easy system to pledge small monthly dollar amounts to help keep this show going. If you're ready to chip in to ensure that the only story that matters keep going forever, head to patreon.com slash scald today. For more information on me, the Scald Prose Volumes, my comic book writing, signed copies of my work, my wrestling talk show Straight Shoot, my bio, contact information, social media, and more, check out AubreySitterson.com. Finally, my weekly recommendation. By this point, I'm sure you've heard people raving about it, but still, I need to add my voice to the chorus. HBO's Westworld is absolutely amazing. You don't need to know anything about the original movie, I certainly didn't, to enjoy this deep, complex, engaging story. I can tell you that it's a weird, smart, sci-fi western, but I don't want to say any more than that, because a big part of what makes Westworld so great is that you, as the viewer, need to work in order to figure out what it's really about. Check it out at your earliest convenience. Thanks for listening. I'll talk at you next week.